Section 5 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 2, March 15, 1919. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Roland. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 2, March 15, 1919. A Hootin' Tootin' Son of a Gun, Chapter 3, The Rodeo, by Howard Dwight Smiley. Things were humming in the little town of Escalante when our outfit rode in about nine o'clock of the morning of the big doings. Everything was decorated up with bunting and flags and old Dutch Arnold's 12-piece band imported a special for the occasion from Denver was blaring away at Arawan, I want to go back to Oregon, and the lads from the other ranches were parading around in their Angora chaps, new shirts, and bright kerchiefs and other adornments peculiar to the great American cowpuncher. We rode down the main thoroughfare following the crowd that was already heading toward the big field at the west end, where the doings were to take place. Buddy was riding heels up, and the boys on the curb were whooping greetings and good-natured banter to the old outlaw and its rider. Everybody recognized Heels Up, of course, he having been a star feature at the previous rodeos, and it must have rasped on some of the old-timers who had been taking high dives from the peak of Heels Up's lifts regular once a year to see this young stranger riding him like he wasn't nothing wilder than an ordinary wooden rocking horse. Buddy returned their sallies with good-natured grins and an occasional wave of his hand, and said never a word for as long as five minutes after we entered town. But, of course, you couldn't expect Buddy to remain silent forever, not by any means. Look at that little Jane over there by the barber pole, he exclaimed suddenly. Ain't she the little Picherino? He was pointing at a girl in a trim, fringed buckskin riding suit a soft white broad-brimmed sombrero pinned back in front and with two thick braids of golden yellow hair hanging down her back. She was being escorted to the rodeo grounds by a slim-built, good-looking young fellow in polished leather chaps with silver studdings. Seeing Buddy pointing at them, the young man flushed up and glared angrily in our direction. Hush a boy, cautioned Highwater Jenkins, who was riding close beside Buddy. That's old man Bradshaw's gal, and the fellow beside her is Wendy Phelps, the crack puncher from the Bar T outfit. He claims first options on that gal, and he's as plumb jealous and irritable as any old house cat, buddy. Don't let him hear you callin' his best gal a Jane, or he'll just naturally claw you wide open. Ain't she the prettiest little thing that ever was, exclaimed buddy twisting around in his saddle for a better view as we rode past the couple, and paying no attention whatever to Hightower's warnings. Somebody introduces me to her plump quick, you bet. When the crash comes, just remember that I tried to tell you, I told him in an aggrieved tone. There ain't a puncher in Escalante today but what knows enough to keep away from that gal, except you, and if you are bound to make a fool of yourself, why, we can't help it. But remember, I told you. Buddy didn't answer, but continued gazing back for as long as he could keep an eye on the couple. It was early yet, but the boys were already busy on the big field. A bunch of longhorns brought in a special for this occasion stamped and bellowed in a high rail corral at one end, as if a cognizant of the coming disaster that awaited them. Down at the other end, a score of ponies, the outlaws, showbuckers, and wild horses to be used in the bucking contest paced about a roped-in enclosure, restive and furtive. Over by the creek in a bunch of cottonwoods were the teepees of a hundred Umcompagre Ute Indians who had come down from the reservation up Utah Way to take part in the doings, and painted and befeathered braves followed by their fat, squat, papoose-laden squaws and good-looking young daughters were mingling with the gaily-dressed cowboys and cowgirls that already thronged the field. 
Half a dozen judges were rustling around, shouting orders and instructions through megaphones and announcing that the drawings for the buckaroo's choice of mounts would take place immediately at the judge's stand. Buddy pushed up with the other punchers who were to take part in the contest and drew his number from the hat. Buddy Rupel of the Tumbling R rides dynamite, shouted the announcer as he read the slip. Whoopee, you'll get yours there, cowboy, shouted several voices in unison. Old dynamite can make that cayuse you rode in look like he was standing still. The harder they buck, the tighter I stick, Buddy retorted, laughing. Tried out the worst you've got. I'm game. Attaboy, cried old Hightower delightedly. Don't let him bluff you, Buddy. Wendy Phelps, separated from his girl for the moment, pushed up to the stand and drew his number. The well-known Wendy Phelps of the Bar T rides Sam Hill, cried the announcer. Wow, 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 shouted the crowd derisively. Showbucker, showbucker, that nag couldn't jolt a frog from his back. Wendy looked a little put out at the result of his drawing, as well he might, for Sam Hill was one of the easiest buckers in the bunch to ride. It would be nothing to his credit for Wendy to stick on top of that animal for the allotted 45 seconds. Ah, for the love of Mike, give me something alive, he shouted at the judges. I was fixing to ride dynamite today, but that new duck from the tumbling R cops him out. I want to trade numbers with somebody what drawed something. Here you are, Wendy, called a tall, lank puncher also from the bar T. I drawed happy hooligan. Reckon he can keep you busy. Thanks, cried Wendy, pushing over to the other and exchanging tickets. Happy comes nearer being a live one than that thing I drawed. I'll return to favor, Slim. He looked around at his girl, and his face went black. Buddy had her corralled off to one side and was talking to her like a house of fire. The young lady was looking four ways, interested, nervous, pleased, and scared. But she was twinkling and blushing like a schoolgirl, and it was evident that she was enjoying our boy's persiflage. It was funny how still everything got as Wendy made his way to where they stood. The girl noticed it first and looked around nervously, but Buddy kept right on chinning as if there wasn't another soul but the girl within a thousand miles of him. Who introduced you to this girl? Wendy inquired in a cold, even tone as he ranged up alongside them. Buddy shot a glance at him out the corner of his eye and went right on with his conversation. As I was saying, Miss Bradshaw, when something uneasy interrupted us, this Galway person says to me, the girl saw it coming, and her excitement dropped her handkerchief. Buddy must have seen it too, for he stooped suddenly just as Wendy's fist swished through the air where his head had been a second before with a swing that would have felled an ox. Buddy picked up the girl's handkerchief with his left hand and Wendy's foot with his right, both at the same instant. What he did with his right hand was never quite clear to any of us. It was a sort of a jujitsu prestidigitator simple twist of your wrist combination of a move, but the result was astonishing. Wendy described a parabola in which his feet and head changed ends, and the latter smoked Mother Earth with a most scandalous thump. Here's your handkerchief, Miss Bradshaw, said Buddy as he straightened up, and without even a side glance at the other man. Well, things began popping on the minute. The bar T crowd and their friends surged in from one side while the tumbling R's rushed in from the other, and in two seconds everybody was shouting and milling and flying wild generally. Without paying the slightest attention to the row he had started, Buddy took the girl's arm and escorted her out of the melee, and of course nobody thought of touching him while he was doing that. It looked for a minute like our little picnic was going up the flute, but before anything serious happened, Highwater Jenkins and some of the older heads jumped in and quieted the youngsters. Several of the Bar T boys got hold of Wendy and led him away to cool off, while Ed Bliss and I grabbed Buddy and hustled him around behind the judges' stand. Now looky here, son, Ed expostulated. You can't go cutting up like that on this man's day. Rough houses ain't on the program no how. I never said a word to that guy, Buddy protested. He tried to start something and I just walked away like a gentleman. I can't see why you should ball me out. That's all right, Ed assured him grimly. 
this Phelps person is one bad actor when somebody starts him, which it's a cinch you have. You can act just as darn innocent as you please, but you take it from me, you're going to hear from that hombre. I ain't sorry you did it, but it's a holy fact, bud, that you can't go around standing folks on their heads promiscuous, particularly Wendy's breed, without getting into trouble. It has been done, Buddy told him with a grin. You quit worrying, Ed. If I can't take care of myself, nobody can. You said something there, son. I'd hate to have a steady job looking after you. You drive a sober man drunk and a drunken man crazy. Now, for heaven's sake, keep away from Wendy's girl until after the big doings and see if you can't travel ten consecutive feet without starting something. Wendy's girl? said Buddy with an inquiring look. You mean Clara Bradshaw? Say, that reminds me of something. Congratulate me, boys. I am going to marry Clara. You what? exploded Ed, scarcely believing his ears. You ain't asked her to marry you already, have you? No, not yet, but you can bet your bright red necktie that I'm going to the first chance I get, Buddy told us solemnly. End of Section 5 a hootin' tootin' son of a gun, Chapter 3, The Rodeo.